It's a joy to be back in the Springs. Um, I have been coming here every year since the very uh, beginning. There is a, I'm so glad to uh, see Pastor Gary uh, here with us today. We've been praying for him uh, in Montreal. People have been praying uh, across the world, really, but at our church in Montreal praying. We have a, uh, I believe that ministry is relationship. It's covenant relationships. So we have a, I have a uh, uh, our church, our church family, and myself, my wife and I, our children. We have a hard commitment Uh, that we had towards Pastor David Wilkerson for years and years. And then with Pastor Gary and Kelly and this church. We pray for this church, love this church, and we are praying. And, and uh, um, if I can say this way, we're calling, I'm calling the church uh, this morning. We uh, have been uh, holding the church up since the very beginning and in the last year as well. So I'm calling uh, the church. I believe it is crucial times for the Springs Church. It is a crossroad and crucial moment in the history uh, of the church, and I'm calling you to pray, to stand with us, stand with Pastor Gary and Kelly, stand with the elders, uh, stand with the staff and pastors, and can we stand together and pray, uh, praying and, and loving and in maturity and in wisdom and in uh, praying, oh God, that the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart be acceptable before you, that we, that whatever we speak to God and to, and whatever we speak to one another would be uh, according to his will and to edify and to build up. Um, I, uh, I felt uh, to bring this message today. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Judge, uh, Judges chapter 6, and uh, we will look together at understanding and fulfilling the call of God. Understanding and fulfilling the call of God. There's a call of God on this church. There's a call of God on your life. Understanding and fulfilling uh, the call of God. As I've, I've traveled to over 35 nations and we receive thousands of emails, our, uh, the messages from our website. Uh, we, we have over 100,000 long downloads, over 30-minute downloads per month. And so we receive, I receive mail from all over the world and, and uh, so many asking questions about the calling of God. How do we find the calling of God and how do we define it and how do we develop it and how do we renew it, uh, the call of God. And, and I, I'm speaking, uh, praying for the message this morning in the last weeks and months. I preach every week and I teach in our Bible school and I travel. So as many messages I could have preached, but really felt to speak on Gideon and on Judges chapter 6 and prepared the message. And I believe it was the right word for this morning. And yesterday, Saturday, uh, I just looked, I just looked on the website, on the Springs Church website to realize that in the whole Bible, last Sunday morning, Adam preached a message on Judges 6 and Gideon, same text as last week of the, out of the thousands of messages in the Bible. That, that was a word. And I, I, great word too. I listened to it. Uh, great word. Um, and I don't, did not feel uh, in any way it would be repetition. I rather feel that it, there will be a conviction and confirmation that God wants to speak to us Um, that this would be the word of the Lord for us as a church at this point uh, uh, in our history uh, together. So lean over to somebody next to you. If they're asleep, wake them up and say to somebody next to you with a big smile, I think God wants to speak to us. Say that to somebody next to you. When we speak of the call of God, uh, we, we, uh, we, are, we need a fresh reminder and revelation that it is universal. The call of God is not for a, a few people, just the, uh, in, in, many, uh, in many Christians' mentality, uh, the, the called ones or the calling, the only callings are if you're called to sing or called to preach or called to teach or called to pastor or one of the fivefold uh, ministries. And uh, the, we need to be reminded that every single person here uh, this morning is called of God. As a calling of God to accomplish something that you are called to accomplish in every season of your life life, in different seasons uh, of your life, that uh, Christianity is not a spectator sport, that we come as you'd watch the ball game this afternoon, you don't come on Sunday to watch the callings of others, the singing, the worship, the preaching, the teaching, the leading, the, uh, and, and, and give grades after and give our, our scores after our evaluation. You're not a, a, an Olympic judge. Uh, you come here and we are to equip you and to develop you in the development of your calling. Everyone, it's universal. Everyone is called. And, and every calling is unique. It's an incredible 
beautiful thought in Scripture is that you are called to a divine purpose, ministry, service, impact, godly influence. What influence do you have? What, how do you influence people? Do you influence them for peace, for love, for forgiveness in your model of life and in, and in a, an actual decisions of your life? Do you influence them towards Christ? Do you influence them towards reconciliation? Do you influence them to a, towards passion for God? Uh, every one of us are called to a divine purpose, ministry, service, impact, godly influence. No one can accomplish uh, uh, what you are called to accomplish. Every single person here, you have been designed, you have been wired, you have been gifted by God to fulfill a calling in every season of your life. Some callings and some aspect of your calling you'll do your whole life. But in every season, if your heart is open and seeking, there will be fresh ways that God would want, want, would want to use you. Not always necessarily the way He used you 30 years ago. Everybody, with every single person, and even the events of your life, even what you think is so hard, yeah, the storms of your life, the battles of your life, the defeats of your life, the victories of your life are used by God to shape you and to fashion you for today's part of your calling. God has been working on you to bring you into the fulfillment. And, and no matter who you, you admire uh, in the world, whenever uh, you, you say, this is the man of God, it's the woman of God I admire so much. Whatever, who, whoever you admire the most, that man, that woman cannot, with all their giftings and impact, cannot accomplish your calling. What you are called to do, the people you are called to touch, the people you are called to influence and to model Christ to, no one else but you uh, uh, can uh, do it. Lean over to somebody next to you and say, don't even try to do what I'm called to do. To say that to somebody next to you. It's universal and it's unique and it's unending. It's unending. There's no retirement in the calling of God. I thought there would be more than two people saying amen to that. There's no... There's no retirement in God's calling. I, every time I come uh, uh, to the springs or this morning, when I, uh, lots of times it's around the world, but sitting beside uh, Nikki Cruz, uh, just over 50 years of ministry. Uh, in the last year, I was so blessed to be able to just make contacts for a whole tour of France. I'm French. Uh, French world is my passion. Uh, and Nikki and the team went throughout France. I was getting emails. The French were forgetting the, the, the time change. So I was getting a six-hour difference. I was getting getting emails in the middle of the night about the services all the way through France after 50 years of ministry. Now, I think Nikki's 50, 52. He started ministry at age two, so he's only 52. But after 50 years of ministry, if you need to be reminded, and I also want to say this to the Springs Church people, when you see this man coming through, I, I hope you are reminded to pray for him and to stand with him wherever he goes around the world facing the devil himself. God gave him in France thousands and and thousands of souls and impact. It's unending. Say it to somebody next to you, no retirement for you. Come on, say that to somebody next to you. It's unending. There's no retirement in God's calling. It's never too late. There's no too late in God's calling. It's never too much happened in God's calling. It's never, I blew it. They blew it. We blew it. It's over. It's not recuperable in God's calling. It's never, we've lost too much. Look how much we've lost. We've lost too much in God's calling. Never. It's never static. It's never stuck in yesterday. It's renewed and often in different ways in every season of our lives. And we will look today at three, three simple principles, three simple kingdom laws, uh, three dynamics from the life of Gideon and the calling of God in understanding and fulfilling the call of God. I believe that, that, that the enemy has come in like a flood over many of your lives and over the church corporately to try to abort the calling of God, the destiny and calling of God. But I am declaring this morning a morning of revelation, a morning of pushing back darkness, a morning of truth exploding and dissipating the lies and of light shining, dissipating the darkness. I declare this morning a morning of defeat for the kingdom of hell and a victory for Jesus. Would you please say yes? 
If you look at Judges chapter 6, and in the first uh, six verses, you have the context of the call, where God would call Gideon. And it's a context where the hand, in verse 1 and 2, we read it last week, and you, you read it at home. But in verse 1 and 2, it speaks of the hand of the enemy was heavy against God's people. There was an enemy's hand. And many of you have felt that way. There are seasons. We, we are every day of our lives in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and, and, heavenly, uh, and, and darkness and heavenly places. But there are seasons when you feel like the enemy has come against you, against your marriage, against your children, against your, your call of God, against your health against your mental health, against your, 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 your own life, your ministry, your serving, your vision. And our enemy has come against us corporately as a church in a, in, a, in a hellish, desperate attempt to bring down the calling of God in our lives. They, the hand of the enemy was heavy against them in Judges 6. And the Bible says that they came against them to steal and destroy everything that they had sown. In verse 3, 4, it says that everything they would sow. And as, as the crop, as the harvest would begin to grow, the enemy would come and steal what they had sown as it was coming, coming up. It is those seasons in our lives where you feel, I thought we were going somewhere. We had begun to build this in your own personal life. I thought this addiction I had finally overcome. I thought things were better for my son. I thought things were, I think as a church, I thought we, we had sown this and, and harvest was coming and the enemy seems to come in and steals it as even it was coming up. That's the context of the call. It was a context where the enemy encamped against them. Literally in the Hebrew, that's all they could see. They, it was in the, the enemy was in their face. If you look at the, the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word, it's as if uh, the face was, it, it was surrounding their faces. It's literally, uh, literally those moments where the enemy would make us blind to what God has done you. They were blinded. All they could see, you know, all you see is the problem. All you see is what was lost. All you see is what disappointed you. All you see is what you think is wrong. All you see is what the enemy seemed to be gaining. The enemy was encamped against them. That's all they could see. Uh, they uh, were blinded to God's faithfulness, blinded, couldn't see it, to God's uh, promises so much greater than anything they're going through. They were blinded to their own responsibilities in their demise. They were blinded to their own sin, their own uh, uh, involvement, the things God had wanted to change in them for so long that they had resisted and had brought this again. They were blinded. Uh, they were hardening uh, uh, themselves and blinded. There was an army of 135,000 men, uh, Judges 8 tells us, terrifying them and impoverishing them to a point where the things that should seem so taken for granted before we're now, we're now impossible to seem out of reach or will never be possible again. They were, they were about, the text says in Judges 6, they were in caves threshing wheat. Their whole lives, the most normal, like breathing, was to thresh, you, you thresh wheat in the, in the open air, in an open field where, where the wind would come and, and help separate the wheat from the shaft. But now they are condemned, they are reduced Reduce the threshing wheat in a cave. It's those moments, it's those thoughts sometimes that the enemy would put in your mind and in your spirit thinking in terms of things that, will I even, even smile again? Would it, would it even be, be possible for me to walk again in fulfilling God's call? There was a day where I, I, my, my breath was, was, was filled with hope and, and confidence and, and expectation. Would that ever even be possible uh, again? That, that's the context in which the call of God come. The people of, of Israel, God's people, had been in a cycle that's very real for us today in October 2015 at the Spring Church. It was a cycle of disobedience that led to disaster. But then they called on God and for deliverance and for their destiny and their calling to be restored. It was a cycle of disobedience. They did evil before, before the Lord. They, they had been called. They had been called to be the light of the nations. They had been called to shine. They had been called to be a, called to be a people that would shine to the nations. That the nations would look at them and, and see them so different, so brilliant. They, they had been called to be an extraordinary people. God's people. 
They had been called as we to be so different that at the way that, that people in this, God's people love one another, are mature with one another, are forgiving of one another, are generous, are filled with hope and strength and, and freedom and worship, that they would be, the, the, the nations would look at them and say, who is their God? But they had begun to copy, to look at the nations around them to look at, at the ways of men around them. I'll say this, we can apply this, of course, to secular things and to sinful things. But I will say this, as a church, as a church leadership, we can end up uh, looking around at this style or this style or this method or this thing. Uh, they, they've been looking around and uh, start to copy things around. And, and please get, get this, what you copy will capture you. What you copy will capture you. So disaster comes and, and Gideon is literally in a place and the Hebrew word is, uh, of the location is, is literally translated a hiding place. A place, a name meaning desert, dry place. The place of dust. They do evil in the sight of the Lord. They don't listen to His voice. They suffer and then they suffer so much. They were so impoverished that they called on God. It's a modern version would be, this is what I would call The, this is what we would see today as the call from the police station. Uh, some of you have lived it. You were young. Uh, you messed up and you had to call your parents from the police station. I did this when I was man, too many times. My poor mother had to come and get me. And, 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 and sometimes she wanted, me, she wanted them to keep me. Uh, and the, uh, or you've lived it, and I've also lived it. You've lived it as a parent. It's, it's that moment where, you know, the call. From the police station, uh, when you have to call, you, you have to call the person that set the rule, set the warning, set life before you, whose rule you broke, and then you're calling to bail you out. Dad, I did, a, I did exactly what you told me not to do, and now what you told me would happen if I didn't listen has exactly happened, so now I need you. To get me out of this. The whole nation is on the phone. The whole nation is saying, oh God, uh, we'll never do it again. Right guys? Right? We'll never. Get us out of here, please. It's the call for the, from the police station. And one thing, if you remember one thing from this message, one thing so important for you to hear and never forget this morning. Do you know what has been and what will always be God's response when we call on Him, even after we've been in that cycle again and again, disobedience, disaster. Do you know what His response is? He always takes us back. He always says, yes, I'll come to you. You call. Also, some of you should applaud because this is the best news for you. The, 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 he loves us so much and sometimes He loves us too much to allow us to escape some of the consequences of our stupid mistakes, our stubbornness, our disobedience, the, the patterns we've allowed over and over to, to take over. He will allow us to experience some of the consequences so we can change and learn and grow and recapture and, and, and re-enter the path, walk the path again of the fulfillment of a call. He will take us back that we would understand and fulfill our, our call. Three key principles, dynamics, and understanding and fulfilling the call of God this morning uh, from G Judges chapter 6. The perspective and response of our calling, the present tense and release of our calling, and the prince of peace and the renewing of our calling. I want you with a big smile to say to someone, somebody next to you, your calling is calling. Say that to someone. Your calling is calling. Gideon is an anti-hero. He's a hero who doesn't think of himself as one, like us. He's a hero who will question God and doubt so totally his calling. A hero who comes from so far, so deep, and seems to be going nowhere so fast. A hero like all of us at one point or another in our lives, or even this morning, a hero in need of a new, of a fresh perspective that he would respond in his calling. So we look together in the Word at Judges chapter 6. And if we read from ver uh, uh, Judges chapter 6, reading from verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came out and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah. This is Oprah before television. <laughs> which belonged to Judah. While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press. He's in the caves. In order to hide from the enemy. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. But Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, 
if the Lord is with us, why? Why then has all this happened to us? And where? Why? Where? Where are all, are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, the miracles of the past, saying, did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord has, is believing a lie. He's, belie he's believing a lie. Now the Lord has, has forsaken us. And he's left us to our enemy, delivered us into the hands of our enemy. Absolute lie. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in, the, in this might of yours. Go in the strength that you have. And you shall deliver and save Israel from the hand of the enemy, the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? When the Lord begins to, to restore restore us to the understanding and fulfillment of our calling, he has to change. He has to bring us to a place where he changes and transforms. He wants us to begin to look at ourselves as he, as he sees us. There's something so deep in Gideon when the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Most of us from the way to church this morning are after in your house somewhere. The, the angel of the Lord appeared and said, I'm with you. The Lord is with you, mighty man, mighty woman of valor. Many of us say, okay. But Gideon has, his doubt is so deep. His pain is so real. His questioning is so intense that he won't even pretend. He won't even fake it. He's coming out with something that has been in the heart at one point or another of any man or woman of God through the ages. He's saying, oh yeah? I mean, this is before God. Oh yeah? The, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Yeah? Well, why? Why has this been allowed to happen? Why are we in this state? Why did we lose so much? Why and where? Where are the miracles of, of yesterday? It seems so, so miraculous for our fathers, the stories they tell. But we here today. Why? Where? Uh, uh, and he's so encanted in the lie. And, and he's seeing himself as abandoned by God and left to his enemy. Which, which raises a, a good question. Where, where do we get our image of ourselves. Where do we get what we think of ourselves? Our perspective of ourselves. We get it from our childhood. We get it from where we were from. I'm, I'm, I'm from four generations of alcoholic, violent men and, and words and, 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 and wombs and things. Were, were, there was a, an oppression over us that, that spoke to us what, uh, the, the, the limitations and smallness of, of what we would be. Uh, it, can, it can come from your childhood. It can come uh, from people that, that you open your heart to. It comes from our background. It comes sometimes uh, uh, from uh, the, the devil himself in his worst, ugliest Devilish, demonic, destroy, dis destructive lies can speak even through Christians. Yeah. That believers speak words over you, speak word over your ministry, speak word over the church, speak word over your family. You can, uh, all these, the, the, these voices, all these perceptions, and, and getting us in a place where, where uh, most of us weren't there. Most of, some of us grew up in the faith. Uh, when we, the, the gospel we knew, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think of saying something like that to God. Where? How come? Where? And, and he responds to all of God's call and grace and love and, and potentiality with this hurt and this unbelief. And, and we're, we're thinking, what, what, is a, what is God going to answer him? What's the Lord's answer to that? Verse 13, sorry, you're right, wrong place, wrong person. I, I, I will go find someone else in Colorado Springs. I will reprogram my GPS to the address, Mr. Spotless Record, 777 Perfection Road. No, no. God says, no, you're, my, you're mighty man of valor. You see, there's great danger in thinking of yourself higher than you ought to. But there's equal danger in thinking of yourself less than God calls you to be and to be. <laughs> equal danger. Equal. Uh, when, when I was beginning it, in the ministry, uh, uh, I, I, my whole life is French. I learned English as a second language. I rarely preach in English uh, even these days. But when I learned English, I, I remember going to preach in churches. And I was very young, very impressionable. And, and there was a, a pastor. And I never had the, the, the courage to tell him to his face. But I'm saying it today. So maybe you'll see this video. But I, I, I was just a young guy. And, and I came in. And there was expressions in English I never heard in French. There was no equivalent. Like this pastor would always, it was very critical of everybody. He had such a negative outlook. And he was always. We would, I, I would say, talk about this church, ah, this church, blah, 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 and this man, and this pastor, and this school, and this, and this, and this. Uh, because of my background, it made me think, I wonder what he says when I'm not around, what he says about me. Uh, but, but, but he would have this saying that I never heard. Of, I, there was no equivalent in French. He used to say, I call it like I see it. 
I call it like I see it. I call it like I see it. You see it? I call it like I see it. I call it. And there was no French for that. I call it like I see it. And after a while, just very little while, it just hit me so strongly, and I feel like telling him today, what a lousy way to live. What a lousy way. I call it like I see it. Don't call it like you see it. Call it like God calls it, like God promises it, like God can breathe it in your heart with the eyes of faith. Someone should say yes. A new perspective in his, his, literally in his, in his response. The Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and you shall deliver your people from the enemy. Have I not sent you? Here's our first key principle. Our calling is not passive. It is active. The calling is not passive. It is active. God says, activate. Go in the strength you have now. Activate what you have in me. Activate what I have done for you. Activate what you know of me. Activate who I am to you. Activate my love. Activate my spirit in you. Activate my forgiveness. Activate my faith. Say amen anytime you like. Activate me in you. Go in the strength I will give you today. Not the strength you thought you had one day or the strength maybe we'll, I'll have when revival comes. Today at the Spring Church, we can activate what God has put in our, go in the strength I'm sending you. God is saying, God, not, not activate in the sense of works or human efforts or legalistic routines or human promises. I promise God. Capacities or abilities or religious de determination, self-righteousness or self-realization. No. Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor, not of what you've done, on what you've done, on what I've done. Not on what you are, what I am. Not on, on your capacity, but my strength in you. Not on yesterday or tomorrow. Go today in the strength that you have. Love today. Stand today. Pray today. Forgive today. S grab somebody's hand today and say, my God, today you're sending us. And we will say yes. Someone say yes, please. Today, it's not passive. It's not passive. It is active. It's not, it's not, it, you go today in the strength. Many Christians are waiting for what they are dreaming for, or what they thought should happen, or what they thought they had planned would happen. But God calls us to activate who He is in us now. A few years ago, I was preaching, I've uh, been in 35 nations, but I was preaching in uh, Papete. Tahiti, not Haiti. I go to Haiti a lot. But this is Tahiti. This is in the middle of the Pacific. You go uh, to uh, you go to LA and then you do like 16 hours to get there. It's a little island in the middle of the Pacific. So I was doing pastor's conferences and they came from like 50 islands around. And I'm there a whole week preaching morning, afternoon, and night. And I said, the last day, I finished at noon. I'm beginning to pack to leave that night. And it's like a Wednesday. I'm only going to get home Friday and I got a big weekend in Montreal. And, and as I started to look all over the place, started to panic. I couldn't find my passport. I lost my passport. I've traveled all over the world. I'll never lose my passport. But I lost my passport. And I was starting to panic. And I'm just, what am I going to do? My passport. This is who I am. My passport. I can't. So I, I, went, I went upstairs. I was staying in the basement of the pastor's house. I went upstairs. And the Tahitian people are wonderful. They're beautiful. But they're very laid back. They live in the island. They're in the, they, they, have, they, they have beaches all around. They're, just, they're very, very laid back, very cool. So I said, hey, I think I lost my pa passport. They said something like, That's a, that doesn't matter, man. You stay with us longer. <laughs> so I said, well, well, has this ever happened before? They said, yes, there was a diplomat, and he lost his passport. We went to the authorities, and, and he got it back. I said, how long? They said, two, three weeks. I was just, no, no, no. So I'm downstairs and, and I'm starting now. You go from panic to just, just doing stupid things. I'm, I'm redoing my steps. I'm looking everywhere, even places that it doesn't make any sense. You're not going to find it in the tube of the toothpaste. I'm still looking. At, I'm looking everywhere. And, and I'm getting angry and I'm throwing things around. I'm like, come on. I'm going one shirt. Oh, don't look at me that way. You're the same. You, you've done this. I'm like, what am I going to do? Come on. So there was a bag. There was just like a sports bag that they had lent me because we had, uh, had done some hiking. So I, I just grabbed the bag, the bag. And as I, as I threw it away in rage and anger, what am I going to do? I just felt something through my finger. There was like two, three pockets. And I opened two, three pockets and... <sighs> my passport was there. My passport was there. It was so amazing. Some of you say, what are you telling us? No reason. I was just happy to have my passport back. No, listen to this. There's a point to this. Losing my passport in Tahiti, I had momentarily lost sight of what gives me access to the resources of my citizenship. I'm going to have to wait till it gets to the last, the last row. 
This is what God says to me. This is what God says to us. This is what God says to the Springs Church right now, October 2015. Go in the strength you have now. It's not passive. It's active. You can pray now. You can love now. You can access my forgiveness now. You can access my presence now. You can access my grace now. Gideon! Go in the strength that you have. I am sending you and all the Gideons say amen, please. And give Jesus an ovation for what he can do through us. It's not passive. And they're studying and fulfilling the call of God. It's not, it's not passive, it's active. The perspective and response of our calling and then the present tense and release of our calling. Our calling is not in the past or in the future. It's in the presence. Present, not passive, active, not in the past or in the future, in the present. In the verse, verse 16, so he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my, my clan or my family or my tribe is the weakest. I'm the weakest, I'm the least and the weakest clan in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. The question is, will you be with me? Will you come with me? Our calling is not in the past or in the present. Gideon could not, could not walk, could not develop, could not get out of this darkness as long as he had his eyes on the miracles of the past and also the, what seemed to him the impossibilities of the future. When God himself calls him, Gideon's, Gideon's responses, rationalizations, and dangerous opposing to God's calling, he says, I can't do it. I'm too weak. We're too weak. We're too small now. Look how many we've lost. Look how small we have become. Look how we were going and then it went down. Look at the crop that we had brought up and they came and stole it. Where are the miracles and breakthroughs of yesterday? He's, he's stuck and blinded in the yesterday. It seemed so miraculous and easy for our fathers. I can, how can I deliver? How can I be a hero? How can I fulfill the call? Uh, uh, how can I believe for tomorrow because of what happened yesterday? But God says, I will be with you today. The call of God is not passive, it's active, and it's not in the past or in the future. And one, it's in the now. It's right now. Because the, the, there's many reasons, but one reason is we, we have a human tendency to magnify the past and the future. That, that, that's, that's Christian folklore. Uh, many of us, uh, you know what he said? Oh, where are the miracles of our father? That we were told about. Who is he talking about? Is he talking about Abraham? Is he talking about Moses? They had great miracles. But they had insane battles. Insane opposition. It wasn't, it wasn't anything else. That what the psalmist described. We went through fire. We went through Psalm 65. We went through fire. We went through floods. The enemy came over our heads. And we almost drowned. But he pulled us out. And he brought us out for rich abundance. That's the testimony. Uh, let me ask. Let me do a survey here. How many of you, you can say honestly, and this is time to give glory to God. God has done great things in my past. Say yes, please. But how many of you would be, would, would remind, would be honest and say, and just be reminded, God did great things, but it was through great battles. Great valleys, great fires, great storm. Don't, don't glorify the past as if it was all roses. No, no. We, God was there and they went through battle. And we also have a tendency to always think the future is going to be so much better. In, in my nation, in Quebec and in France, there were, and many French countries of the world, they have a revival mentality where uh, one day revival will come. And when revival comes, pff, we don't have to change, do anything. It'll just happen. Uh, one day, one day, one day, one day. I want to give you a news flash. Don't wait for revival. You are living in 2015 in the season of time in history when there's the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the earth. Say yes. God is already doing it. He doesn't have to change. He doesn't have to be convinced or change. He, we need to change. We need to get to the place of our hearts being where, where they need to be in our lives so that today, not yesterday, not thank God for what he did yesterday. Thank God for what he'll do tomorrow. But I'm here today and we need a move of God here. I need here today that it's not passive, it's active. It's not in the past or in the future. We have this, this, this you know, on the human level, we have this tendency of always think that the, the next step's going to be so, you know. No, I mean, you know, this is steps of life. Yeah, I saw all the little kids running around. When you're a little boy, two, three years old, you know, a lot of kids, you know what their dream of? When can I go to school? 
I want to go to school. I want to go to school. Mom, let me go to school. I want to, I want to go to school. What happens when they go to school? I can't wait to be out of school. I can't wait to be. Oh, come on. That's, this, is through, this is throughout. Uh, yeah, in church, I've been pastoring 30 years, single people in church. Oh, I want to be married. Oh, if I can only be married. Where is he? Where is she? Where is she? You're listening to the preacher, but you, you're worshiping God, showing you have no ring. You're doing all kinds of things. Just to, <laughs> it's that type of worship. It's a, it's a proclamation worship. Oh, I want to be you're single. I want to be married. I want to be married. Come on, when you're married. Oof, I wish I was single. Sometimes, sometimes, just sometimes. You know, people, when, I, when I, I want to have kids in the house, I want my, my house filled with kids. Oh, that, to have kids in my house. What happens when you have them? I can't wait till they're out of the house. When, when are they going to be out of the house? He's 27. He's still there. When is he going to be out of the house? Oh, I'm talking to men and women for a second. Men that spend their life dreaming of my retirement one day. Oh, 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 retirement. I know a lot of guys. I'm 53. I, I know a lot of guys that have turned 60 back, prepared their whole life to be able to retire. And the week after their retirement, it's 7.45 in the morning. They're sitting. They don't know where to go, what to do. There's no retirement. Not yesterday. Not tomorrow. Today, I'm going to serve. Today, I'm going to see God move in my life. Say yes, please. God said, God said, today I'll be with you. I am with you. I will go with you. Will you go with me? And this is a kingdom principle. If you seize this, in your worst seasons, in the seasons of your worst pain, the reason why we have to activate today is because tomorrow begins today. And the, the, the restoration of great things for tomorrow depends on your release and responds today. And because yesterday and tomorrow cannot seize the victories, God is calling you, calling us, and is calling to lay a hold of today. I can't go into the details publicly and on, on the internet, but after 30-some years of pastoring, we've had a lot of battles in 30-some years, and I think you've seen it all and you've been through. If you take our shirts off spiritually, we, we were covered with all kinds of uh, battle scars. But the year 2015, 22 years pastor of our, uh, our church in Montreal, uh, pioneered with 40 people and been there 22 years. So we've seen a lot of things, been through a lot. But I, I have to say to you that the year 2015 so far, a few months left, has been the year of, of height, of paradoxes of, in my whole, our worst year in ministry and, and in some ways some of the most glorious breakthrough. We we'll baptized over 300 people through the year, and, we, and God gave us all kinds of breakthroughs in ways. But the year started with death, with the death of one of our pastors. His wife found him at 40 years old. That, that so many things that were surrounding that that were so, so, just so dreadful, so sad, so, so such a, a, a weeping and such a, uh, a suffering. And, and through the year, one after the other, and many, many people on staff and sickness and different things. And all the way to last week, we're on Friday night two weeks ago, and we, we're going through the years coming out of the, the storms of the spring, and then people are being saved, and we're planting churches, and churches are growing, and, and man, God is doing something amazing. And, and last Friday, two Fridays ago, uh, we have a Friday night, 500 young adults were there for a, a, our service. Over 100 people came forward that were there for the first time to give their lives to the Lord. And as the service was beginning, listen, as the service was beginning, 13-year-old girl ran across the street right in front of the church to come to church. And she's so excited because she has a Christian mother and the dad is not a Christian. And it was such a battle in the house. And they're praying all week so she can come to church, have permission to come. And she comes and runs across the street. It gets runs over and killed in front of our church on a Friday night when the services started. I came through where I was and I walked on the premises. There's a police perimeter and the next day the media, the, the television, the helicopter, everything else all around us. How come the pressure, the funeral, the, the, the mourning and the, you just, you just, you're going through a, yeah, and, 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 and going through, through that storm and that, that type of year, that type of moment, that type of Gideon season where he says where and why and how and how come if you and that place in your life If we, in that place in our lives, allow ourselves to be filled with him and to look to him and to say, you're, sa you're saying you're coming with me, I'm going with you. God will use you in that place for the miraculous and for the greatest breakthrough. Say yes. This is not a, just a thing for pastors and preachers. This is for everyone. 
I mean, a picture's going to be on the screen of a, one of our elders who's been with us since the beginning. Uh, last summer, we took this picture. He took our wife and I. Uh, he's, a, he's a man who has a business and very successful, but amazingly generous, a man of prayer, man. Him and his wife uh, have been pe- uh, uh, elders and, and pillars of our church, and they took us, our wife and I, to a helicopter, a helicopter tour last summer. And when we look at that, and we took that picture, we think this man on the left... Uh, <laughs> He's not a care in the world. He's got a fa- his family, his business is booming. He's so happy. So, and he didn't know that a few months later he would go for his annual uh, at the doctor's. And uh, he's gone every year and everything was fine. A year ago, they didn't see anything. But they went. And while, every time I look at that picture, we didn't know that he had a tumor. He had a tumor that, uh, enveloping sarcoma cancer over his kidney. That they said that as soon as he went, they said the next day we started in chemo. And they were talking about 10 to 20% chance of survival. All of a sudden, everything is just, everything spins out of control. Everything, and, and while he, he, he was going through his chemo, he came in my office and we prayed together. And he starts the chemo to operate. They're going to operate. They're going to open him up. They're going to take out one, one kidney and try to scrape off the cancer from every organ. It's just, it's a, his whole life is spinning. And during that time, in the beginning of this year, we're going through the storm at the church. And we're going through the funerals. And we're going through the death of this man and everything else that came with it. It was such a, and we're both just spinning and, and, and in 2014, in the years before, the last five to ten years, we had been serving. And, and many of the mercy ministry we're doing, one thing we were doing more and more is taking care of the kids that are in the system. That from 11 to 17 years old that have been beaten, have been raped, have been abandoned by their family, have been, uh, have been violated. And they go into these, we started visiting the, the government centers and they were worse than the prisons. So we started helping. And, 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 and what broke our hearts is we would take care of them from age 12 to 18, visiting them all the time. And when they came out, at 18, there was nowhere for them to go. So the street gangs would get them and the girls end up uh, prostitutes or sent to strip joints and all that insanity. So, so in 2014, we said, uh, 2015, we're starting a ministry. We're going to have a little house for them so they can come. We thought some little storefront, whatever it is. And when the year started, all this mess, all this spinning, and this man, this, this elder calls me and he says, hey, one of my business friends uh, called me and said, there's this amazing building on, on our street right in the worst neighborhood. And he was building Built just a few years ago. It's brand new. It's got apartments. It's got kitchens. It's got offices. It's got everything. And they, they, uh, it's evaluated at over $2 million. But I think my friend says we can get it for under a million. So let's just buy it. We'll flip it, resell it, and make money. So he's, he's in his cancer. We're in funerals and death and mourning. But his heart is still thinking. His heart is saying, even in this, God can use me. So he says, Pastor, can we go, can we go take a look at it? Uh, he says to his friend, uh, we'll not, please let, let me have the building. We'll, we'll not flip it. I want to I wanna, uh, use it for something else. His friend says, oh, it's for one of your God things? He says, yeah, yeah, it's for. So he says, tell God that I was in on it. I helped you with it so he can uh, help me too. So we went, and when we got to the street corner, he didn't know what was happening to me. We got, and, and, you know, and he's, he's in his chemo and everything else. And we get to the street corner, and I got funerals. And, and, and when I got there, I started weeping. Because that very street corner, I've driven that corner, not another street, corner, Chemin Chambly and Dubuc, two streets. On that corner, we're going to see a picture of the building. On the street corner uh, is this building. And this is a corner that for years and years, every morning, afternoon and night, I would drive at five on my way to church in the morning. I would drive in the afternoon or night. There are prostitutes on the corners. I've seen teenage prostitutes there. I've seen mothers with their baby in a crib uh, and, 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 and hooking on the street with the baby. There's baby right beside them. And I've prayed a thousand times, oh God, someday we got to do something. And two ladies from our church that, that are, uh, have been through their own storms would go and witness to these ladies. And they would go on that street corner. It was just an empty lot. They would go on that street corner and they would say, God, give us something. One day you'll give us something. They thought some little building, some little. But hey, their, every prayer was heard. We bought the building. We renovated the building. And it's called, uh, you're going to see uh, uh, the, uh, the next slide, slide, please. This is, the address is 2159. And our logo says that where hope has found an address. The next picture, hey, next picture. Next picture, look in the back, inauguration, the mayor of the city is there, everybody's there. Behind is my friend, he had his operation, they took his kidney out, he's cancer free, there's no cancer, he's in health. I'm to, oh, come on. What? What could God do through us in the midst of our storm if we stood today and say, God, you're going to change this storm into a story for your glory. Say yes, please, and give him praise as we close. 
Lastly, perspective and response of our calling. Calling is not passive, it's active, present tense and release of our calling. It's not in the past or in the future, it's in the present. And the Prince of Peace and the renewing of our calling. Please, please understand that Apostle Paul says that these texts, these, these pictures in the Old Testament, all these things happen to them in the Old Testament as our examples. To teach us as they were written for our understanding and our instruction upon which the ends of the age have come. It's not passive, it's active. It's not in the past or in the future, it's in the present. And here's the last thought you have to let it, let, let it fill your spirit. The, fulfill, the understanding and fulfillment of God's calling is not natural, it's supernatural. It's not in our own strength. It's not in our own methodologies or capacities or wills and plans and provisions and ambitions. It's in, it's supernatural as we are in communion with Jehovah Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Last week, Adam preached it, and you can look at it at home. It's very particular. But in this picture, we have in, in uh, Judges 6, the Lord calls him, mighty man of valor, where are the miracles? I am with you. Now activate. Don't look to the past or the future. Go now in the strength that you have. I shall be with you. Will you be with me? And then there's something that almost looks out of place if you don't get it. Then, then uh, Gideon says, okay, uh, he says, Lord, I... I, I th show me a sign that it's really you. I'm going to go do something and wait for me. He says, literally, he says, do not depart from here. He says that to the angel of the Lord in verse 17 and 18. I pray until I come to you and bring out my offering set before you. I'm going to go do a sacrifice and I'll come back. And the Lord said, I will wait until you come back. I'm here to say to someone, it's important, the amazing mercy and patience of God. He says to someone today, I've been waiting but I will wait till you come back. I've been waiting till you come back from your murmuring and your criticism and your unforgiveness and your, I've been waiting, but I, I'll be back. I'll, I'll be there when you come back. I'm asking you to come back. When you're going into, into things that away from my will and my, you go, but I'll be back. And Gideon goes and he prepares a sacrifice. You can read the text. He prepares the animal. He prepares the fruit of the, uh, the, fruit of the of the vine and then he prepares the offering that is uh, the um, unleavened bread he prepares an offering of unleavened bread an animal that is offered and the fruit of the wine and of the vine and then the sacrifice is accepted by heaven the fire comes from heaven God heaven accepts the sacrifice and Gideon falls on his face and he says now I know I've seen God face to face, and he built an altar there, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my Prince of Peace. Please understand, this is a prophetic picture. In the midst of the calling of God, there is, an, like many times in the Old Testament, Theophany, Christophany, many times in the Old Testament, there's an announcement that God would come and offer his son the sacrifice, the uh, offering of unleavened bread and the, uh, the body and the blood that would be shed that would be offered to heaven. Heaven would accept the sacrifice and the Prince of Peace would die for the sins of all and would rise again. And now every believer has access to the supernatural peace and resources that only will make you able to fulfill the call of God on your life. It's for a person. It's for a Christian. It's for the church. It's for the, the church today. It's for our church. The Bible says that as, as the offering and as he declares Jehovah Shalom in verse, a few verses later, 34 and 35, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew the trumpet and all the men gathered behind him. It was, a, it was a peace that came to Gideon that was so, was so supernatural that he was able to appease himself and to receive a direction. All the men are terrified around him, and he's terrified himself. But as he's on his face before Jehovah Shalom, my prince of peace, supernatural peace comes. Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Supernatural peace, direction, leadership, supernatural choices, supernatural decisions. So I call every believer in this church. I call every elder. I call every leader. I call every pastor of this church in the season that is ahead of us so crucial in determining our destiny that we would understand that it is not by our own strength, but it is by His Spirit. 
that there's no provision or protect, protection without prayer. That there's no testimony for God until we call on God. There's no stories for God until we call on God together. Every man, every church, every church leader, every person that has been through brokenness and hurt and torn up, bringing the torn pieces to God like Gideon did, that the Prince of Peace would appease us. I call every Christian leader to model forgiveness, to model releasing of the hurts in the past, and to model it that would start with the head, husband, wives, leaders coming down to the whole church. This summer I was preaching as the musicians come. I was preaching in Times Square Church. And um, I was, it was a one year anniversary of my daughter's wedding with her husband. And we took them to New York. So after we went visiting some sites with them. And we went to Ground Zero. And I'd been there before since uh, September 11. But I, there was new things that had been. There's a museum, in-ground muse museum that has been built. And it was very, very uh, moving. It's quite impressive. Because you go down and you are down uh, way below. And, and the guide tells us that there are 3,000 bodies under our feet. All around us. And they have pieces of the actual buildings and, and everything. We're right there. They have a museum there. And one of the things that was so, so moving to me is they have this huge wall. The picture is going to happen. Uh, it's going to be on the screen with me with the, with the flag. They, they call it the freedom flag. There's a huge flag there at the basement of uh, uh, Ground Zero. And, I, and he looks all torn up. And, and when you look up close, and there was a plaque explaining... I was blown away, and I asked my wife, take a picture uh, of me. Of course, my wife says, can you never stop thinking of a sermon, just, just live the moment? But this is what I do. So I, I was there, and I said, no, no, take the picture, because it's a freedom flag. And when I, when I read the, 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 what it was, how it was made, I was so amazed. It was put together from hundreds of pieces of deactivated flags. Whenever there was, they put a flag in front of a building, here or abroad, government building, anything that's governmental, when it's torn because uh, uh, there, there was, there was a, a bombing or fires or earthquake or terrorist attacks or hurricanes or tsunamis or floodings, the flag is deactivated. And somebody thought, and they, they had the piece of the flag that was actually there on September 11. So somebody thought, we're going to gather these pieces of deactivated flags and put them together as a flag that they call the flag of freedom and faith and liberty. Now, there's many things I love about Americans, and, and I wish uh, French was more like that. One of the things I love about Americans is patriotism. I love, I love the, Amer this, this to me, this flag is so American. It's so, word of, you think you got us down? This is our flag of freedom, and you know, and this is a flying high, and you know. I mean, I... I I got the passport to prove that I'm Canadian. But in that moment, in that basement, the man told the story and spontaneously, everybody there, rah, 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 whoa, rah, 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 hoo -ah, you know. <laughs> that moment I was an American. And, and, but I also thought, this is us. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And I want to say to somebody here today, and I want to say to this church, the enemy might have, you might have thought that the enemy deactivated you, that the church is deactivated, that you're out of commission, that you're out of business, that it's too much, that it's too much, we've lost too much. God says, no, I take broken pieces, broken lives, hurt me, and I bring them together under the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom. And I declare my glory. Say yes, please. Can you handle me three more minutes? Say yes if you have faith. Three more minutes. All the others, I'll pray for you. It, it won't be long. You're going to go watch a football game for four, five, six, seven hours. Some of you are going to watch two football games today. Bear five minutes with me. I was preaching uh, pastors' co conferences in Canada for the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. They're all pastors. A thousand pastors came together. And I was doing it in different areas, different cities. But there, 95% or 98% of them were evangelical beautiful men of God and women of God, but from a non-charismatic background. And they were just beautiful people, but they had never invited what they call a Pentecostal, a charismatic pastor. And I could feel they were nervous. Somebody invited me. And, and when the guy introduced me, he was almost doing like, you know, like radio stations when they go, the opinions uh, expressed do not necessarily reflect the, it was that kind of thing. He was, he was actually naming the guy who invited me to try to say it wasn't me who got him. I don't know what they thought I was going to do. I don't know what they were afraid of. So I, I really felt to speak on Isaiah where he says, the flame that is still flickering I will not put out. And the broken reed I will not throw away. 
I'll start to speak on that. I will, I will, I will fix the broken reeds, says the Lord, until music is heard again. I will, I will heal and I will kindle and breathe and feed the flame of your life, your heart, your passion, your ministry, your calling until you burn again. He doesn't throw people away. There was a Salvation Army pastor that came in and I didn't know anything about him. But a few years before there was this church, there was a split in his church. They had built the church and God was using them. And there was such a horrible split in the church. And it just, it was so ugly and it was so hurtful. And his wife was sinking into a depression. But his daughter, who was a teenager who saw all this, was, was loving God and serving passionately in the church when she saw all this. And I've talked to her after, since. She says, when I saw all these Christians that knew God for so long act that way, be so mean-spirited and be so cutting and be so bitter and unforgiving and speak such horror about her parents and about the whole situation that she drifted away. It's not an excuse. She, her, her eyes should have been on Christ. But she was 18, 19, and she started drifting away. And to the absolute horror of her parents, she started using and fell into an addiction. She ran away. She became a runaway. And they didn't know where she was for over a year. Didn't know where she was in the country until they got a call from a the other end of the Canada, Canada is very vast, and they were, this was like a thousand miles away, the big city of Vancouver, and the cops called and says, we arrested your, your daughter for solicitation, prostitution, in, a, in, a, in crack apartments and all that. So they flew to go and get her, and by the time they got there, they had let her go. So can you imagine, this is a pastor and his wife, and he went for three, four days on the street corner, looking at her from midnight to three in the morning to try to see praying that she would show up so they could grab her but that she didn't come back so when they came back home he was just it was just too much there was too much loss he's a Gideon he's in he's in the cave wine press and he why and how and where and too much so he's, he, he wrote a letter of resignation and thank God for spirit felt God is our peace leading of the Holy Spirit elders because one of the elders told them before you resign we don't accept your resignation but before you go you want to resign go to this conference we feel led to pay this conference for you we're going to pay a few days you're going to get some rest go to the conference maybe God will speak to you so he didn't really want to come but they were so kind to him so he came and he came in this service and he sat after the worship everything and he sat in the back while I'm speaking about the broken reed and the, he will not throw away the, flame, the flickering flame and in the middle of that portion which is very unusual but not not prepared at all but I just started weeping and I said it's even it's even somebody here that you've actually written your letter of resignation to your soul and God says no and 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 he was so pure so also not used to, to gifts of the spirit or that type of it was so precious I haven't seen that many times in my own ministry when I was when I said that there's somebody here he actually reached out in his briefcase in front of everybody he stood up and he said it's me so beautiful it's me I wanted to resign I'm just I'm just I'm at the end of my rope and I'm, I'm, I'm a broken reed and, and everybody was like whoa you know so I said hey brother I'm almost done just just uh, you'll come up in a minute and we'll, I will pray with you so I finished the message and I called them to come and a lot of the pastors came and their wives and I came to pray with him and his wife and I put my arms around them started to pray over them and the Bible says you understand that at this point it's not a manual, it's not a technique, it's not new paradigm, it's not a governmental organizational change, it's not, you need to have the Spirit of God, the Jehovah Shalom that comes in at the place of hurt and does something that is supernatural. Say yes, please. So I'm praying with them and, and praying in the Spirit for when we know not how to pray, the Spirit make an intercession. The groanings that cannot be uttered. And the words that came out of my mouth in, in their language, in English, I, it wasn't a usual prayer, but I started to say, hope was gone, but hope will be back. Hope was gone, but hope will be back. And when I said that, the mother crashed to the floor. So I knelt with her, and he came down, and I'm holding them. And I didn't know anything about anything of the story that I'm telling you now. They told me after. And then through their tears, the, the, the dad starts to say, our daughter left and all that. And he says, my daughter's name is Hope. She's called hope. Hope was gone and hope will be back. So I said, well, brother, God's speaking to us. Come on. So we stood up and prayed, wherever she is, bring her back. Oh, God, and I pray for them now, your peace. 
Prince of Peace, come do a work in their life, the work of your spirit. You understand that it's not passive, it's active, it's not yesterday or tomorrow, it's right now. And it's certainly not natural, it's supernatural by the peace and the presence of God. A year later, I, was, I kept in touch with them, and he, he said that, uh, in the weeks, that, that months that followed, he was right, emailing me, and he says, I, I, I tore up the resignation. God is with us, and, and, and he's going to God, and God is strengthening him. And a year later, I'm uh, preaching in the same conference, different city, and I see him come in with, him, with his wife, with his beautiful tall girl, comes with they all in Salvation Army uniform. They came in, and a month after, about a month or a month and a half after the conference, his wife, his daughter, Hope, came back. She didn't only come back. She came back to God. She came back to, to repentance. She came back to service in the church. And this is years ago. This summer, uh, they came to church during the vacation, came to a service. He's there. His wife is there. Hope is there. Her husband, baby in their arm, all serving God together. Hope was gone. I want to say to somebody here, you have not been deactivated. This church has not been deactivated. Hope might have been gone, but hope is back in the presence of Christ. Would you do this? You gotta, you gotta shout and applaud and, and go crazy over, over the Broncos and that's fine. But this afternoon, can we stand and can you give God an ovation? Can you give Him, can you give Him a shout? Come on. Come on, you, you, can, you can do. Say, oh God, I'm coming to you. I want you to bow your heads with me. I want to announce that there's a new day dawning. This is, we're going to sing, bless the Lord of my soul. Announcing a new day, whatever may come. And while I was praying with this, for this message, and I believe that Adam is speaking it last week and this week, confirming it, that him that has an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying, the Church of the Springs, Colorado Springs, October 2015, crucial moment in the history of this church, this body of believers, and in your life. And while I was praying for this message, this is not a legalistic thing, this is not, you don't have to. We had an amazing moment in the first service. I had this picture in my mind as I was walking and praying the Spirit for this morning. I had this picture, this moment of the whole church coming together in prayer at the end, together, coming together, calling on God moment of unity, a moment of forgiveness, a moment of release. The restorations of tomorrow depend on our release and our response today. So if you're here today and you say, yes, I had been focusing on past or future, and I will activate, I, will, I hear the voice of God that says, go now and the strength that I will give you now. And I want to activate my love, my forgiveness, my faith, now, you're here and you say, I was, I've been facing something that was so huge that I couldn't see anything else. But I thought I was building up, we were building up. I had seen as if the enemy had come to steal it. But today I'm coming to God. It's not by yesterday or tomorrow, it's today. And I'm coming and I need the Prince of Peace. I need, I will not be able to bring peace to my family, bring peace to the situation until I walk in that peace, that shalom, that supernatural hope was gone, but hope, I am a piece of a tattered flag. I thought the enemy had said, you're deactivated, but God is bringing me back with me, my brothers, my sister here in the Springs breath of his spirit and the wind of his spirit is going to blow and we're going to become a flag that announces freedom and liberty and faith in Christ so today if you would allow me if you feel open to do this I asked in the first service and everybody just came I would like to ask you I would like to have this picture of us praying together can I ask you to leave your seat everybody to come here in the front to say we're coming together this is a moment for the church we're coming together would you come close here in the front from all over the place families husband and wives grab, grabbing each other's hands and when you come here come close so everybody can come behind you thank you i see young people i see children 
They need for the adults to be examples, to be models of forgiveness and love and maturity and peace and faith. I see sons, I see daughters, I see parents, I see grandparents. Sons in the faith, mothers in the faith, brothers and sisters, would you come from all over? This is the people of the Springs Church. Would you come? And as you come, would you begin out loud to speak to God? Would you say, Lord, oh God, you're coming with me, I'm coming with you. Oh God, fill me with your spirit. Oh God, open my eyes to see you. Oh God, you're not, I'm not disactivated, I'm activated by you. Oh God, I will serve today, love today, believe today. Oh God, I want to. I want to understand, but I also want, especially I, I, beyond all, I want to fulfill your call on my life. I want to be an influence of peace and of love and of faith and of joy and of encouragement in this body. Oh God, fill us in it. And then in great respect for one another, brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters, unless it's husband and wives or family members, of course, but would you put a hand on somebody next to you? Everybody praying for someone, brother with brother and sister with sister and families and husband and wife, fine. Would you put a hand on someone and just out loud begin to pray for them? Maybe you know them very well, maybe you don't, but God knows them. And in some parts of their lives, hope was gone, but hope will be back. And God is bringing the flag together. Can I hear your voices praying for one another? It's a new day dawning. Hallelujah.